so welcome everybody. I'm very happy to be here today to, to join you in this very, very nice event. I'm happy that I, I, I met uh, earlier people uh, able to bring me in in the, in the SCA world. Uh, my name is Federico Marangoni. I live in Bologna, uh, not, not very big, but not very small as well, middle city uh, in the northern part of Italy. So uh, my city has uh, Etruscan origins and then Roman origins, and then we go further to, you know, medieval times, Renaissance times and so on. So uh, history is something that has always been uh, very, uh, very interesting for me, uh, and it was all around. And for this reason, today I want to talk to you about something that uh, concerns my city. Uh, I, I, I study and research uh, fashion history and costume history, so I'm interested in all those aspects connected to fashion and to everyday life, mainly for the centuries between between the 13th and 16th century, mostly for the Italian area and the Northern Italy area as well. Uh, I am also a, a an actor, uh, but I'm not very, very practical one. So you won't see me doing, mm, sewing and creating clothes and I'm not able to do those uh, uh, very, very nice uh, lessons that uh, uh, show you how to do the, uh, the things. But I uh, um, read and study a lot of documents and uh, sometimes I also have the chance to, to have them in my, in my hands because I go in the archives and so on. And for this reason, uh, I decided to talk to you about sumptuary laws today and sumptuary laws of my city because sumptuary laws are something very uh, useful to merge the two, the two aspects because they are a theoretical thing Okay, they, they, they are concepts, they are laws, uh, but they also uh, unite uh, uh, the practical aspect of uh, uh, giving you information about uh, what people used to wear, uh, how they should wear it, and uh, also what people used to think about those clothes or those accessories and what those things uh, could be used for. And for this reason, Mm, the class of today is about the history of sumptuary laws in Bologna because uh, uh, sumptuary laws, it has to be noticed, uh, are very, uh, a very common phenomenon in, in, in Italy uh, because Italy was uh, divided in many um, uh, different states and for this reason all, every, well, almost every state, every city sometimes had their own law. Sometimes they were very similar one to another, sometimes they had differences, and I will try to show you also the reasons behind those differences. Uh, first of all, because I, I don't know what is your background or what you probably had, have already read about it, some choice laws are laws regarding luxury. The term comes from Latin, uh, sumptus in Latin means luxury. And uh, so those laws are uh, aimed to reduce or to regulate the amount of uh, uh, expenses that you can do on what you wear, even if it is a, uh, either it is a, a dress or a jewel or um, something that you can carry with yourself, like a bag or a fan sometimes and things like that. So uh, some choice laws, were born not in medieval times, actually there were some even in Roman times, but usually they are born in a, a complex uh, civilization. So when you have a, a structure of your state uh, complex enough to allow people to spend things, spend money on things that are, they are useless uh, apart from being nice and beautiful, then you are uh, having a luxury and people, uh, the, the, the governors can, uh, uh, they, they sometimes thought that it was a bad thing that people uh, could spend so much money on useless things. Uh, so behind some choice laws, there are uh, moral and ethical reasons as well as economical reasons. 
because we don't have to uh, forget, and this is very clear in the uh, medieval laws mainly, uh, that the um, okay uh, the um, in, at the beginning of every uh, sumptuary law we have an introduction where usually uh, the, the the governors of the city say said that um, people are were spending too much of a, of their money and they were becoming poor because of that so uh, the city governments decided to pro uh, prohibit certain uh, um, expenses and to forbid the people to spend too much of their money. So this is the, the, um, the scheme, the, the idea. And uh, considering, as I told you, that there were many, many different cities, uh, independent cities in the Middle Ages and also several different states in the Renaissance period in Italy, we have laws from Bologna, we have laws from Imola, which is 30 kilometers from Bologna, but it was in the Middle Ages a different city and with different governors. Uh, you have laws from Florence, from Venice, obviously, and they lasted a lot. They, they, they were reissued over the time, but we know that Tuscany and um, uh, Venetian Republic were very, uh, had a very long life. Uh, but there were laws also from little little town, which uh, now we don't think are so important, but at that, that time were important enough to have their own laws. Bologna is a, uh, it's an interesting uh, um, example, because uh, in medieval times, uh, the city was one of the very first cities to issue uh, sumptuary laws. The first laws from Bologna that we know date back to the uh, 13th century, to the mid of the 13th century. Even if some uh, norms uh, concerning luxury started the, uh, at, the, at the end of uh, the 12th century. Uh, I found um, uh, uh, a law about uh, uh, luxury fours uh, in Genova at the end of the uh, 12th century. Uh, there are some uh, some little norms uh, in uh, Reggio Emilia in uh, 1199. So it started, let's say, at the beginning of the 13th century because that was the, the last part of medieval times when people were richer. Uh, there was the, there, there had, ha, had been uh, an economical growth in that century. And for this reason, uh, the cities decided to um, prohibit certain expenses. And then we can start seeing uh, some details about uh, those laws. Uh, I've read on the chat about the salon that uh, people, uh, teachers and uh, uh, students were asked, asked to wear their, their clothes. Uh, Gigi is doing so. Uh, I, I was not able to put on my clothes because I'm talking of a long period, so I decided to use just hats. So, this is my 13th century coif. Always wear it with the, with the knot. If you wear it, wear it with the knot. And then my typical communal hat. This is a, a very a uh, simple hat which was very common uh, during the, um, the Middle Ages in, uh, in the, um, okay, here, so I can check my, my uh, you can find it on, uh, um, for example, uh, uh, several uh, Florentine uh, frescoes or also from several manuscripts, so it's very, it's very common. Uh, okay, I'm just here. Uh, the, as I told you, the first laws, the first sumptuary laws in Bologna were in the middle of the uh, uh, 13th century and exactly from 1250. Uh, in, they actually were not an independent set of laws. They were inserted inside of the city statutes and this, this continued over the, the centuries. Uh, but the, the, the first laws, the very first laws issued at that time, at that date, were actually uh, connected to prostitutes. Uh, the only sumptuary norms from uh, 1250 and 1261 statute uh, allowed the prostitutes 
to wear things that were not allowed to normal women. So in the rule, uh, you could read that uh, uh, public prostitutes, uh, I, I read you the, the passage, uh, they, they were not, uh, they were allowed to, they were called publica meretrix, which I think is quite clear. They were allowed to wear gonnella, vel guarnacca, vel guarnazzone, pelle, vel mantello, aut suppa, vel aliu di indumentum, sive mantaturam, quattanga terram. So, translated, they were allowed to wear gonnella, which is the uh, tunic over the chemise. Guarnacca or guarnazzone, two versions of uh, an overgarment. Uh, pelle vel mantellum. Pelle means uh, a cloak with uh, fur inside, or mantello, which is a cloak without it, or uh, una, another uh, covering, and any other uh, garment that could touch the ground. So, regular women should not wear long uh, clothes, uh, while um, prostitutes could. could. And this is very uh, interesting uh, for two reasons. First, we understand that uh, uh, prostitutes at that time, just like now, needed to attract their, their clients. Their, uh, so men were more attracted by women dressed in sumptuous uh, clothes. But at the same time, if you say that uh, a woman with a trail in their, in their tunic or in their guarnacca, uh, is a prostitute, then regular women will not wear a long dress because they would look prostitutes. So it's like with the um, with some uh, you know mini skirts now. Uh, when some very very provocative things, people even if they are wrong doing so, but people would think that you you are uh, if you are walking on a, a sidewalk with those with certain kind of clothes, people could think that you are doing that job uh, because the, the clothing that you are wearing reminds them of that kind of, uh, of uh, garments. So in medieval times, the, the, the aim was very clear. If you, if you dress uh, according to the law, you will not look like a prostitute. And uh, uh, Sumptuary laws were issued, were uh, made known by the population, and then in the statutes there were also officers sent around the city to check on uh, women to see if they were respecting the norms. And it is nice because uh, uh, researchers find, found uh, um, um, it, it was a text uh, from an officer who was reporting uh, to the um, to the communal offices, that he, he tried to find a woman uh, who was wearing a, a, long, a long dress, but she did not uh, allow him, and the people around her uh, forbid him to measure the trail of the, of the dress, so he was not able to find her because other people around her, her relatives probably, uh, opposed to that. And this is nice because, first of all, we see that laws were not only on paper, but were made um, put in action. So people were asked to, to respect those laws, and there were officers um, fining people around the city. And in the statute, it was clearly written that you had to go, it is written in the uh, 1288 statute, uh, you should, the, you public officer, should go out of the churches on Sundays or on Saturdays during the masses uh, because women usually wear their best dress when they go to the mass. And for this reason, you will probably find more people to find in that, uh, in that situation, which is very uh, similar to what we see now as well, at least in Italy. Uh, when there are some events like, uh, you know, football matches or... Uh, uh, concerts, people park with their car everywhere, okay, out of the parking lots and so on. And sometimes there are, uh, um, you know, the, the policemen uh, going here and there finding people because they know that in that place there will be a lot of uh, transgressors to the, to the law. Uh, 
I, I cited the, um, I, I said something about the 1288 uh, statue. Actually, that is the first st city statue with uh, uh, specific sumptuary laws, but they were not uh, uh, connected to clothing. Uh, in, the, in that statue, they main concentrated, mainly concentrated on uh, uh, weddings and funerals. So the public ceremonies in which people, during which people usually uh, uh, spent a lot of money and uh, used those occasions to, to show their wealth. For example, uh, th there, are some, uh, there are several rules uh, there. And uh, one of them uh, says that uh, um, the churches should not uh, ring the bells uh, in, in the whole city, but just the church where the funeral is, uh, is held should ring the bell. Uh, because probably sometimes uh, uh, people asked uh, to, the, to the priests to ring the bells on the funeral of an important member of their family to show that they were important all around the city. They were important for whole, all the city. And this was uh, forbidden by, by the law. And it is nice to notice that uh, even if this law comes from the 13th century, the same norm is uh, still present in this document, which is the Provisione Okay, provisione sopra i funerali, which means law uh, regarding funerals. It was issued in 1573 in Bologna. This is the, the original document. Uh, I found it in an antique store, antique library, uh, bookshop, sorry, uh, some, uh, some months ago. And uh, um, in the second chapter, it says that uh, uh, che non si possi suonare Ave Maria per dar segno che qualcuno sia morto, ovvero campana, se non nella parrocchia del morto. So you should not make uh, uh, people sing Ave Maria, or uh, not the Ave Maria from Schubert, obviously, another uh, music, because <laughs> Schubert was not born at the time. But Ave Maria is a religious uh, uh, song. And uh, you should not uh, have the bells uh, be rang uh, other than in the church where the funeral uh, takes place. So three centuries after the, that first norm, it was still necessary to say, you don't do that. Uh, meaning that sometimes some choice laws were issued and reissued over the time because people uh, did not respect them or because it was very difficult to check and to um, let people uh, get used to those norms. Anyway, uh, as we progress, we arrive at the um, beginning of the 14th century. There is something to be noticed at this point. Uh, the first laws, the 13th century laws, uh, did not say that some people could and some other couldn't uh, wear, apart from um, prostitutes, all the citizens of the city were touched by the laws. So even if you were a very noble man or a very, very noble woman or a very noble, very rich woman, you would be uh, told to dress accordingly to the, law, to the laws. In, uh, in, at the beginning of the 13th, 14th century, in uh, 1335 instead, there is the first exemption from those laws. Uh, the statue from uh, uh, 1335 is not very different from the 1288, but doctors and uh, doctores and milites, which means uh, uh, knights, uh, the doctors and uh, knights, doctores in uh, law and in medicine, just those, and knights who were noble, noble men of uh, ancient uh, nobility they were allowed to let their daughters or wives uh, wear the, the um, prohibited dresses. So if you were uh, the, uh, the, the daughter, for example, of a law professor at the university, you were allowed to, to dress uh, differently from the other women in the city. And this is important because it gives you uh, an hint of the importance of university in our city. 
you probably know that Bologna, uh, Bologna University is the most ancient one in the whole world. Uh, and uh, it is very, very famous. It was very famous. Uh, it is famous now, but it was very, very famous in the Middle Ages because there were less universities as well. And uh, uh, Bologna University was uh, famous mostly for uh, um, law studies and also for medicine, but less. Uh, we started with, uh, with the law, civil law uh, teachers. And uh, for this reason, those professors, those um, teachers were very important in the city. And this is one reason probably they were uh, made even to the noble, man, the, the noble ones. And this is something that uh, continues. During the whole uh, 14th century, you will find in the statues, there are several. There is one in the 1357, there, an, there is another in uh, 1376. You will always find uh, those exemptions for uh, uh, doctors and knights. Uh, sometimes the rule uh, change a little uh, in, um, for example, uh, in the 1335, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, some, some rules for uh, funerals and weddings as well. Uh, you could just have uh, three friends at the banquet, uh, at the wedding banquet. Uh, you could just service uh, three different types of food at the banquet, uh, excluded the fruit. So four, four services, one probably one with meal, one with uh, uh, with fish sometimes, uh, something sweet, uh, usually at the beginning, not at the end as we do now, and then the fruit. But uh, uh, however, the laws were uh, uh, very strict and very detailed, saying that you could not serve for uh, four or five or more uh, services at the wedding uh, uh, at the wedding banquet. So this is just to say to show how uh, invasive sometimes uh, sanctuary laws were supposed to be, even if it was difficult to, to check. And as I told you, uh, it's uh, very interesting that we have the fines of uh, uh, public officers uh, according um, checking on those events. For example, uh, for the 14th century, we have uh, several fines, uh, mostly on dresses, uh, not on uh, uh, weddings and funerals. Probably people were uh, uh, more happy to comply to the laws when they were getting married than, they than, than when we, they were going to here and there in the city. Let's say that. Anyway, uh, it is... Uh, um, it, the law became longer and longer, and we have uh, a lot of different things. For example, um, there were uh, rules for the guests. You could not have more than 20 guests at the, at the wedding. And uh, um, there were um, the, 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 the accessories and the jewelry that you could wear, could wear were usually without pearls without precious stones uh, and uh, you were um, forbidden to dress with uh, fabrics uh, with gold or silver in them and this is a rule that goes all, all through the uh, the Sontroy law history in Bologna and this is interesting also for for a reason I told you that there were economical reasons be behind the, the sanctuary laws and um, you I don't know if you know it but Bologna was a very important for all the middle ages and also the renaissance times was a very important center of production of silk production so from Bologna uh, there were a lot of silk fabrics going out in the European market not only in Italy but also abroad but the silk uh, fabrics that Bologna was specialized in were veils, very fine, very transparent veils, some of them plain and some of them crisp. But uh, those uh, specific kind of uh, tissues usually are not for, for, forbidden in the, in, in the statues, in the sanctuary laws. While instead, uh, we usually find velvet, uh, heavy and with the heavy fabrics uh, like velvet, like uh, altibassi, so which means uh, higher and lower uh, fabrics. Uh, so fabrics with different layers of uh, of uh, threads, uh, 
which were not produced in the city. They usually came from Venice or later on from uh, Genova, Milan also, and places like that. So if you mm, say that people could wear silk dresses or silk veils, but not velvet dresses, you are saying that they will buy, that you have to buy uh, the local production. And this way you will, under, you will help your economy uh, contrasting the others. It's not very different from what we see now with the wars uh, on uh, international commerce, okay? China and the, the USA, that they argue they should tax more the, the, coming, the, the products coming from abroad, okay? If you produce something in your, in your own state and people from your state are allowed to buy on only that production, uh, you, will, you will sell what you are producing, okay? It's, it's like if... Uh, uh, Trump uh, uh, issued uh, a law saying that only Ford and General Motors cars uh, could be bought by American people. Okay, you cannot buy a Toyota, you cannot buy a Suzuki and so on. Then the Japanese economy would be affected and the American economy would be uh, benefited from that. And this is the same that happened in, uh, in, in Bologna at that time. The same as uh, is for jewelry. Milan, for example, uh, was a very important uh, center of jewel, jewelry production, uh, both uh, true and, and fake. They also were specialized in producing fake precious stones and so on. And in several laws, we will find uh, uh, that governors say, okay, you cannot wear golden crowns with pearls even if those pearls are fake, even if the gold is not gold, because it would look like gold, it would look like real pearls, and then uh, people would uh, compete with you as well. But in Milan, you will not find many sumptuary laws, and in those, usually the exemptions are very wide, uh, because riches, the richest people were invited to buy those jewelry because Milan was producing it. So it was no use to reduce the internal market uh, from, uh, with laws. And for this reason, in Bologna, they are very heavily uh, uh, regular, uh, norm normated. I don't know if it is correct, but I, anyway. Uh, th there were laws very strict against jewelry, while in Milan, there were not. But we are in the uh, 14th century, so I have to change my hat. Okay. Then, this is something also that is uh, uh, everything that you will see uh, comply with the sumptuary laws of my city. <laughs> Even if male usually were not very affected by sumptuary laws. Uh, usually women were uh, hit by the laws and the norms. But sometimes in some cities, Florence, for example, in the 14th century had laws uh, regarding both male and women, and also Bologna in the earliest uh, laws. Uh, for example, the uh, prohibition for velvet, uh, golden and, silk and silver velvets uh, is also for male people in the 14th century. Anyway, uh, when we arrive at the end of the 14th century, the, there is a, a new thing uh, happening in the, in the laws and in the statutes, and it is uh, the bowling. I don't know if the pronunciation is right, but you, you were asked to, uh, when a new set of law uh, came out in 1398, uh, the um, governors understood that uh, if you just had bought uh, a very expensive and new dress, which is now illegal because we have just issued a, a new law, uh, those, uh, those dresses, that, that money that you spent uh, is lost, it's completely lost and it was even more useless because uh, you, you cannot even wear that dress. So to, to be kind, let's say, toward the citizens, they allowed people to keep wearing the illegal dresses, uh, but only if they had bald, so if they had uh, registered them in a precise, uh, in a specific register held by the commune. 
So people were asked to go to the communal, to the town hall where um, a public officer would have written down the name of the, of the woman, the kind of, the type of the dress. And from that day for several years, uh, it was uh, eight, then nine, uh, it changes a little. You were allowed to wear that dress, but just because you checked it when the law was uh, issued. If you had done it later, then it would have been uh, taken by the commune, okay? So, uh, this is something new for Bologna. Actually, it, was, it wasn't new at all for Italy because there are registers like this also uh, in other cities, uh, in Siena, for example. But uh, this was uh, uh, very uh, important for researchers because those registers still exist. And for, for Bologna, we have a list of more than 200 different uh, lines of uh, uh, different dresses. Uh, and uh, we know the names of the people uh, wearing them, uh, the, the name of the woman and the name of, the, of uh, her father uh, or, or her husband, according to if she was married or not. Uh, because women were not responsible for themselves. Usually the fines were paid by, um, were paid by brothers uh, if, they, if the dad was, uh, if the father was, was, that, was dead. Uh, the fines were paid by the husband if they were married and so on. And uh, um, for this reason, we have a very interesting list of uh, those garments and we can understand the very the, the richness of those and the complexity of those as well uh, those were actually um, interesting also uh, for, for another aspect we can check on the terms of clothes because uh, when you go and read the ancient inventories for example or uh, wedding gifts and so on, you will find uh, several names uh, which are not used anymore, okay? We, we now wear some clothes which are called like in medieval time, for example, camicia, this is a camicia, the shirt, uh, but camicia now is something that I wear outside while camicia in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance time was something that was, wear, was worn uh, as an underwear. So certain terms remain, certain other disappeared. And for this reason, it, it's interesting to understand uh, where certain times were used and for what kind, what kind of garment. If you, uh, if you see a, a painting, a fresco, you don't have the names of the clothes uh, uh, on, on it, okay? But you can say that, that that guy is wearing a guarnacca, is wearing a choppa, because you have the documents. And this is why I love so much uh, mixing the sources. Uh, if you have a, a document, whatever document you, you can use, you, won't, you usually don't have uh, images. But if you have a, an image, you usually don't have the terms and the information on materials and so on. So you have to unite them and use both of them, documents and iconography, to understand how things were made even before that you start, start making them, okay? Or to understand how to make them properly. And uh, we are at the very beginning of the 15th century, so still in the Gothic period, uh, but now we arrive to the 15th century. In the 15th century, Bologna was, uh, uh, for a short period, a signoria, like Medici in Florence, like uh, um, Sforza or Visconti in uh, Milan. In Bologna, there were Bentivoglio. The Bentivoglio family was uh, um, a local family, and for around 50 years, uh, from the middle 15th century, to the end of the 15th century, they ruled Bologna. But they were all, always uh, in conjunction with uh, a Pope uh, um, officer. There was a cardinal sent to Bologna to govern, to reign over the city together with the Signoria. For this reason, the sumptuary laws, which were moral uh, laws anyway, they were conceived at least as moral laws, uh, were used to, uh, usually were issued by the, the cardinal. So when in the 15th century, and this needs a, a change of hat, obviously. 
OK? A very typical Capitanesca from the 15th century. OK? It's not very straight, but it has been in the, in the, in the bag for a long time. Anyway, uh, at the, in the middle of the 15th century, uh, there was a cardinal called Bessarione. He was uh, in, from uh, uh, Constantinople. Uh, but he, he was uh, sent to control Bologna and uh, Romagna and so on. He issued a new set of law. And here we have the, the new uh, um, change of uh, pace and change of vision in sumptuary laws, because he divided the society in uh, several uh, levels. I will show you um, uh, a graph I, I did about that. Uh, uh, here it is. Okay, so I have to check, share screen, here you go. Share. Okay, do you see it? It's a pyramid here, do you see it? Okay, so at the top of the pyramid there were those who were not uh, uh, regulated uh, or they had very few uh, um, regulation. They, they could wear almost everything and they were knights. Under them, there were doctors, the professors from the university, as I told you. The third level was uh, nobles. So uh, knights were conceived as nobles from ancient families. Other nobles were uh, people living in the city from, for, for less time. And then there were money exchangers, uh, um, people uh, producing silk and people selling uh, um, fabrics. And then there were in the fourth level, the butchers, uh, people producing wool, uh, people uh, selling gold and artifacts, uh, people uh, uh, working with the um, uh, field, uh, cotton field uh, things, clothes, but as well as mattresses and so on. Strattaroli, the, the um, uh, resellers of used clothes. And then here on the fifth level, you had uh, uh, all the other arts. So the, all the other working people of, of Bologna, uh, blacksmith, uh, uh, wood carvers and so on, um, people dyeing uh, fabrics, okay? And in the last level, you had people doing opera rusticalia, which is uh, um, uh, doing, uh, working in the, in the campaign, in the, country in the countryside so um, peasants from the from outside the city uh, were allowed to wear just very simple very simple clothes with no gold with no silk no red silk in particular because it was the uh, most expensive while on the other levels you would have uh, uh, more and more and more and more till you get to the night to the top so this is uh, uh, okay and now No. How do I get back? Okay. Uh, okay. Are we back or not? Well, well, however, uh, if you still are she seeing the pyramid, it's the same. Uh, anyway, that structure was very strict. And you can understand that this uh, uh, division is uh, uh, something similar to um, uh, closed society, okay? If you are a, a daughter of a blacksmith, you have to wear like your mother. She was the wife of a blacksmith and so on. Uh, that mm, led to some problems. Um, because there were um, prohibition and uh, norms also for the for the highest uh, society. For example, this is very funny. I will tell you uh, quickly. But the, the Bentivoglio family uh, at that time uh, um, uh, celebrated a very important wedding uh, with um, uh, uh, Ginevra Sforza from Pesaro. Uh, she was getting married to the to the signore, to the Bentivoglio governing man. And uh, they were uh, um, they were uh, having their their wedding in the main church of the city. But since the, their dresses and the dresses of the guests of the wedding were 
all of them were against the law. They were too luxurious because also richest people had some, uh, some rules, as I told you. Uh, the cardinal did not allow them into the church. So when the, you have the, the big procession, they arrived in front of the church and they found the door closed. And then they had to go to the church, which was uh, close to their palace, where a priest more, uh, let's say, sympathetic with the couple, uh, allowed them to have the marriage. So they didn't marry in the main church of the city, even if they were the signori of the, of the city, because the cardinal was uh, angry uh, with them. Uh, this uh, division remained for the rest of the 15th century, but in the, at the beginning of the 16th century, things uh, uh, changed again. So the division were reduced and usually you will find in the 16th century uh, laws concerning uh, peasants, concerning not noble people from the city and noble people from the city. So uh, we can say that the sixth level became just three uh, with the highest top um, almost without uh, restrictions. Uh, with the middle top with some restriction and peasants again with a lot of restriction. Uh, in the 16th century actually you have really a lot of laws because they had printing the system at the time and uh, they were not more anymore in statues, they were not in city statues but they were as uh, uh, independent uh, little uh, uh, um, sheets like, like this one so you can see this is the, the, the norm for the funeral that I showed you before. It is just a few pages. This was issued and distributed in the city. It is just eight pages. Distributed in the city and uh, um, declared, pronounced publicly in the, in the square. So uh, that ru those uh, rules were um, ever changing. Uh, every time a cardinal, a new cardinal came to the city to govern it for the Pope, because at that time Bologna has definitely entered in the Pope state, uh, every time he arrived in the city, uh, the, um, the new cardinal would issue a new law, which usually is, uh, was very similar to the previous one, but with this name uh, on it. And uh, for this reason, uh, we can understand that probably laws were uh, not so effective because there were really a lot of them. In the year 1568, uh, uh, there were three different uh, laws reissued. So the same law issued and then re-pronounced, re-declared publicly and then another one. So uh, people obviously were not respecting too much those rules. And there were um, a lot of uh, debate, uh, debates about that because uh, uh, some people used to say that uh, if you are noble from your family or you are rich, you should show that richness in order to be more respectable, uh, to, to, to distinguish yourself from, from those who are poorer. Uh, and so it was also a philosophical matter as well. Uh, oh, I forgot to change my, my hat. Okay, and uh, uh, in the 16th century, there are some uh, um, important uh, figures. For example, the Cardinal Gabriele Paleotti. He was the one with the three issues uh, of sanctuary issues uh, in the same uh, year. And uh, he also wrote, uh, um, it was the time after the um, Trento Concilium has ended. So uh, after that new uh, set of rules were uh, uh, issued for the whole church, okay? And uh, he wrote uh, several, um, um, let's say, books about uh, his vision of uh, Schwamtrail um, dressing and uh, luxury and so on. And for example, just to, to, to give you some hints, he was really, really against pearls. He was against because uh, he was against pearl because he said that uh, uh, pearls were very variable in their price, and this is quite modern as a view. So if you buy a pearl in the moment when you want it, you will probably pay it more than its real its real value. But then when you want to sell it, maybe because you need money, you had uh, some expenses, 
then you will sell it for less because you need to sell. And uh, gold, for example, does not have this kind of uh, variability. And for this reason, is very strongly against pearls. And is also against earrings. He says that they are disgusting. Um, and he forbids every woman in Bologna, uh, from the richest to the poorest, to wear earrings, uh, especially the, those uh, uh, circular ones, which were mostly um, the, the most common, let's say. Uh, so you can understand that uh, studying some choice laws is something very interesting if you want to not only to enter in the in the houses and in the wardrobes of uh, people of that time, but also to enter in their in their mind. And for this reason, I find them very, very useful, interesting, and sometimes also uh, amusing. Mm, I just checked the time, so I know that we are almost at the end of our hour. Uh, so I'll stop here. But if you want to ask me something, I'm very, I would be very happy to answer to you and to get back any feedback that you have. So if you guys would um, raise your hand, I'll unmute you and you can ask questions. Um, I've also, I have a couple of resources for Federico that I want to post in the chat box. And I'll also post in the Cadoro Italian Salon. It's his um, website, his Facebook page, and he also has a Patreon where there are more videos of instruction on different topics from uh, the 12th century all the way up to the 16th century, I believe. Yeah, the Patreon page has just started, so I'm putting more and more uh, material on it. Uh, so if you want to take, uh, to, to take a survey, to have a look to it, uh, you are welcome. And then you will find uh, many other videos about clothing, about uh, terminology, about food, um, about uh, dueling, because I'm also a teacher of historical fencing, so things will uh, will arrive. Okay, so let me get that into the chat box. And um, there is a question from Evan. <laughs> Evan Quicktong, go right ahead. All right, thanks uh, again uh, for the two. Um, do you have any books on sumptuary laws, uh, particularly those written in English, that you can recommend? Uh, well, uh, sumptuary laws uh, from Italy usually were published uh, concerning uh, uh, Florence and Venice, as far as I as, as I know, uh, because they they are definitely the most famous cities uh, uh, from Italy uh, abroad. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any about uh, uh, Bolognese, some Troy laws. Uh, there are some, uh, um, some in Italian. Actually, they are not very um, easy to, to access because mainly they are in Latin or in original Italian without any translation. Uh, my plan actually, because I also wrote a couple of books uh, about uh, fashion history, and uh, I'm planning to translate uh, several sumptuary laws from uh, Italian Middle Ages and the Renaissance time. I'm working on a project with uh, uh, several, several titles on that. So I, I cannot tell you now Bolognese sumptuary laws books, but they will be soon, uh, uh, finger crossed. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you enjoyed it. I hope I was not so... Too, too detailed or not enough detail. So, okay. Federico, grazie mille. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I know that you have a very busy life. Um, <laughs> I will post your Patreon things in the, wait, I already did. Yes, I post the link okay. to your website, your Facebook group, Thank and you. Patreon in the chat box and also in the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, see you next time. Ci vediamo. <laughs> Ci vediamo. Arrivederci. Ciao. Ciao.